Welcome to the Innovative Data Solutions for Preparedness, Response, and Recovery session. For the next 90 minutes, we will be focusing on innovative data solutions in planning, response, and recovery. We have four presenters today, Nearmap, Highfeld, Here Technologies, and Esri. Each presenter will have 15 minutes to present, followed by five minutes of Q&A time. Now, as some of you are aware, we like our Inspire sessions to be as interactive as possible, which is a little easier in person, but we're trying in this virtual environment. So please use that Zoom Q&A functionality, ask questions. Our presenters will try their best to answer everything within the allotted five minutes. However, they will be answering questions via text in the Q&A as well. So we will go ahead and get started. First up, we have Amanda Marchetti, Product Manager for Nearmap. So Amanda, go ahead, take it away. So thank you guys so much for just taking the time to join this webinar today and to learn a little bit from what each of us panelists um, is gonna talk to you about. I am here to talk to you a little bit about what aerial imagery has to offer in terms of preparedness, response and recovery. I'm with a company called Nearmap and we have um, just embarked on a journey that to kind of change the face and change the way that we actually collect aerial imagery. So I'll show you a little bit of an example here where we collected um, some pre-cat, so pre-catastrophe imagery, and then some post-catastrophe immediately after Hurricane Laura. And then you can watch us actually start to map that recovery effort. And this is just to show you a little bit of, this is the power that aerial imagery brings. You'll notice that our cameras are a little, are quite close to earth. Our resolution is quite high. We collect at 5.5 centimeters, and I'm going to walk you through a quick overview of all of our product lines. And then my colleague, who's also on the line, Chuck, is going to give you a live demo of how all of the location intelligence content that Nearmap brings to bear can be brought together to help you in your resilience, response, and recovery missions. So with that, I'm going to move quickly, since Trisha said I only have 15 minutes. So. Here's what we do. We collect, we have created sophisticated systems out of our corporate office in Sydney, Australia, that can fly high and collect huge areas all at once. Then we quickly process those image mosaics and pipe them into the cloud and to your fingertips at our web-based platform that we call Map Browser, or through a whole host of APIs that we can talk to you about. And so why are we different? <laughs> It comes down to that coverage. We are doing something that no other aerial company has done before. We're collecting aerial imagery in a similar vein to what a satellite does, which was what we call that repeat capture, or what a satellite would call repeat revisit. And so we do this not just across the United States, but since we are an Australian company, we're collecting across Australia up to six times a year. We also collect across New Zealand and Canada. Now, the way we choose our coverage polygons, what you're seeing on that map right there, is based upon population value. So we are searching for urban cor corridors and where the people are, which is what's important for disaster response because it's the people and the, re the regions of, um, yeah, of populations yeah, across the country that matter, that we gotta get back up on their feet when disaster happens. And hopefully that we're gonna actually inspire to be more resilient by having more current imagery. Because again, we got that repeat capture rate um, by knowing the current state of their area prior to the event happening. So here's a quick overview. So we don't just collect three, um, 2D imagery. We also collect 3D as well. We have what we call photogrammetric 3D. And I just wanted to give you a quick idea of that fo coverage footprint as well. So we're covering areas on, <laughs> our vertical imagery of 55,000 and above. And then for 3D, we cover higher populations or we have some statistical modeling that we actually use to choose the areas where we need to cover 3D. If we need to expand that footprint, that's something we can always do. So what makes us unique? I'm gonna run through this quickly because I think I've covered a few of these value props with you guys already, but we do offer that high resolution. So 5.5 centimeters is something you don't typically see from an aerial provider, especially at the scales and that repeat capture that we're covering. And those frequent updates build into rich data sets. And so not just rich data sets in terms of what I'm saying here, but we do offer that 2D imagery, 3D and AI derived data, but we also offer that deep archive dating for back to 2014 in the United States. 
And so, and then I've already mentioned, we offer that 24 seven access. We put imagery at your fingertips um, through our map browser platform or through our APIs. And we can get that imagery up into the cloud within one week's time. We've done it in as quickly as one day's time. And one of the things that we really strive for at NearMap is consistency. Consistency in capture, um, consistency in that cadence of capture, where we capture, cadence of capture, and also quality. So one of the fun things I always like to mention is we actually keep an, uh, what I call a, a imagery psychologist on staff. And he actually measures the human response to imagery to make sure we're always tuning our imagery to the highest level of aesthetic value for our customers. So we'll have the most gorgeous imagery on the market. So let me talk to you quickly about what we have. So what we offer is obviously vertical, that top-down view, but we also created a way to um, not just provide oblique imagery, but apply a, provide oblique imagery that you can pan and zoom. So it's a seamless mosaic that we call a panorama provided in four cardinal directions. And then in addition to these oblique offerings, we also provide that 3D view that I talked to you about in a wide variety of formats. And I'll show you more about that. And then lastly, something that I think is pretty hot on the market right now, but is very unique in the way NearMap does it is NearMap AI. And I'll talk to you quickly about that. And then again, I'll pass to Chuck and he's gonna show you how all this content can come together to serve your disaster mission. So quickly, this is our just quick snapshot of our vertical. Like I said, we clicked at 5.5 to 7.5 centimeters and we have um, oh, 8.6 inch positional accuracy, 21.9 um, centimeters. Uh, and then quickly panorama, we use this. Uh, we provide this in multiple perspectives. So your four cardinal directions and we give you that uh, ability in seamless pan and zooming in those four cardinal directions. The difference between panorama and oblique though, is that when you look at our oblique offering, we actually give you all of the images that we collect. And so this is our rawest form of data, the rawest form of, a form of data out of near map. It's collected at 7.1 centimeters, just because that camera is just a little, you know, off, off nadir and at that oblique angle. But we collect multiple package, pictures as we pass over any feature. So when you're running image interpretation and you're trying to understand something that's difficult to interpret because of its size or because of its clutter, having those extra views can often give you just that line of sight, that unobstructed view to what you need to see on the ground to make the critical decisions that have to be made. So oblique, our obliques are fantastic. They're measurable because it's our raw data. So they haven't been distorted or stretched in any way. So next we have our 3D data. So I'm gonna go into that on this next slide. But 3D data is used for a wide variety of use cases. And we have a wide variety of offerings in this family of data. And so we start with our textured mesh. We have 3D textured mesh, which gives you that photorealistic viewpoint. And this gives you that ability to communicate what's happened on the ground throughout your chains of command. It's the easiest thing for any human to understand without having to be a geospatial expert. And if you wanna learn more about any of this, I, we actually have recorded a more extensive um, uh, presentation on how to utilize this data as part of the recovery session um, that's up and available through Inspire. But I'll quickly move on to point cloud because I know we don't have a tremendous amount of time. With point clouds, we offer a point cloud, which is a photogrammetric point cloud. So it's based off of a photogrammetric um, 3D interpretation. So it's not LIDAR, but it'll work well with your LIDAR data sets. And then we also offer a digital surface model. The digital surface model is what, it, it's the 3D model without the texture. And it shows the elevation of every feature, including your buildings and trees on the Earth's surface. And then we have digital terrain that scrapes the earth as if it were bare. So it removes all the buildings, all of the vegetation and shows you just the sculpture of the earth's surface, um, just the geomorphology, which is fantastic for flood mapping. And then the last bit is true ortho, which is fantastic. It's actually a 2D product, but we included it's created from 3D data. And it gives you a perfectly nadir view with zero building lean. So you can peer inside of urban canyons and you can have just an enhanced and easy way to digitize the conditions on the ground. All of this data is offered at a 15 centimeter resolution. 
And it's offered on, again on a repeat capture once a year across the footprint that I showed you earlier. So the last thing I wanna quickly talk to you about is NearMap AI. Because we have this rich content stack, this rich data set at that 5.5 centimeter resolution, we can extract things with artificial intelligence that, um, that just most other providers just can't do. And we can do this on a current basis. And so what I'm showing you here is just a list of some of the things that we've already started collecting and providing to our customers. And this list is consistently growing because we didn't just create, you know, we created an artificial intelligence capability, but a lot of companies are right now. Well, uh, we created on top of that, just a system that allows us to rapidly actually model for new features. So if there's a feature you can discern from our imagery, we can create a model and create it across our footprint um, just within a, I don't know, a few weeks time. So with that, just keep in mind, we're right now, we're stacking up our infrastructure data. So we're all, where all of the swimming pools are, where the your basic land classification data is in terms of your surface types like vegetation and water bodies and natural soils. We map construction sites um, and we map a, you know, a very clear and consistent building footprint. But also things that you might not have considered from other providers like roof material and roof shape. At our resolution, we can actually discern more intimate details about the environment on the ground. And we can see smaller things like power lines and power poles. So all of that data is available offline um, in vector or raster format. And it's also available for visualization via Mac browser, just so you can see um, what the data looks like before you purchase. So in terms of delivery, I mentioned we offer offline and then if you ever wanna test a sample, you can also reach out to us um, and we're happy to provide you a sample of the types of data that we can offer. And so I think I've covered most of this. All of this data again is collected at 5.5 centimeters um, and we are always growing our capabilities because again, we created that, kind, that way to scale. So reach out to us if you have questions about this offering. Right now we're collecting it and creating it and sorry, creating it and providing it on a one year turnaround. So we can update that. We can update your data sets on a yearly basis, but we're also open to chatting with you if you needed to update using that cadence that we collect of once um, one to three times a year. So if you need a more frequent update, that's something we can discuss as well. So with that, I want you to see a little bit about how this data comes together and actually serves in the disaster mission. So I am gonna pivot over to Chuck. And the last thing I guess I'll say is this data is offered via Map Browser, with the data we can get it to you via the Esri Marketplace and through our WMS and um, other integration options. So with that, I'm gonna pass to Chuck and let him show you this data in action. <clears throat> Hey everybody. Yeah, my name is Chuck Dossel. I manage our solutions engineering team here in your map. So um, this is our map browser that you're seeing right now. This is where we can export um, a lot of different content. So uh, including our AI and our 3D in a lot of different formats. Uh, so that's actually what we've done here. You can also stream this in through our APIs uh, or we can deliver larger data sets to you offline. Uh, but all the data that's inside of this ArcGIS Pro uh, is all from NearMap, uh, and all these are derivative products that you can create from our content. Um, so in this example, we're doing some flooding analysis and some fire analysis. So I'm going to cruise through these really quickly. Um, this is with our 3D textured mesh. We'll just give this a second to, to render on the 3D. Uh, but then we've also got a flood simulation layer that we've created from a normalized DSM, a DSM, and a DEM. And then we've done some, some cool labeling with ArcGIS Pro as well. Um, then we can look at a few other areas uh, that are impacted as well. And the next thing that we would do out of this is, um, this is all from our, our vectorized AI layers and our 3D and our imagery. Um, so the next thing I want to do after this is kind of take our roads layers from our AI and figure out which roads would be uh, inundated during a flooding event, uh, because we've, we've kind of done that with, uh, with buildings in this example. So if we go to this building here, 
and we'll turn on this nine meter flood simulation. And now you'll see that it's um, starting to inundate a lot more buildings. And let's turn off the textured mesh and turn on the buildings that are affected by flooding. So we've taken the AI data sets, the AI vector data sets, and applied roof forms to those and extruded them uh, by, their, by their type and their roof shape and their peak height and their eave height. So a lot of different metadata that all comes out of our 3D and combined it with our AI. And then we're able to see where we've got uh, buildings that would be affected by flooding. And of course, this goes really slow on a, a live demo. But as we go in here, you'll see that um, some of the buildings that are affected actually have different symbology. Um, so they're, they're categorized differently. So on this one, you can see the blue area is actually what would be affected by flooding. Uh, so we can actually pinpoint individual structures and see um, if they're gonna be impacted by a flood event. A similar scenario here with uh, fire risk. Um, so again, all these uh, LOD2 buildings here were, were created from our, our elevation models plus our AI layers, um, including the uh, metadata that we've got labeled here, uh, the peak height, um, the number of stories, uh, the roof shape, and the eave height. And then you've got the, uh, it's symbolized by the number of stories here as well. So let's turn on a fire risk layer here. So we've taken the, basically the vegetation layers from our DSM and kind of clipped those out. And then we made um, a tree fall distance to see how far of an offset uh, structures would need from uh, vegetation in order to uh, to avoid a tree falling on them. So uh, it's a common thing with doing uh, fire analysis, fire risk analysis, is figuring out what that defensible space is between buildings. So here we've taken that buffer and then done a similar thing where we apply that to the buildings themselves and segmented out which buildings would actually be affected um, by fire. Uh, and then we can also compare that with the mesh as well. So you can kind of see a, a 3D visualization of, of the rest of the environment uh, to go with it, including, you know, all the vegetation and stuff that we, that we had mapped in a 2D, uh, kind of vector 2D, 3D format. And that's kind of what it comes out to here. So you'll see that uh, we've got a lot of options on how you can work with this data, a lot of different things that you can do with it, kind of the you know, your imagination is the limit when you've got 3D, 2D, and AI data sets that all kind of combine to solve a lot of different solutions. So we've only got three minutes left, so I'll stop there and see if we've got any questions. Hi, Amanda and Chuck. This is Elsa at NearMap. Um, I'm also with the NearMap team here, and we do have a question from Daniel. Um, Daniel is asking for near map, do you have specific requirements in order to go beyond urban areas? Also, what is the estimated time frame for doing a plane, a planned flight? Are there specific thresholds that you require in order to do an unplanned flight for a given area? And additionally, do you at the time also plan for follow on flights for the same area if for an unplanned flight? to determine progress or restoration. So there's a couple of questions there. Um, Amanda, Chuck, feel free to, you know, I can start one by one so we can answer Daniel's questions. Yeah, I'd be happy to answer that really quickly. So we do have some specific requirements. We have to have a large enough area um, that we'd be able to accurately capture the imagery. It also has to be uh, something that would be, um, you know, a value and repeatable. Now, for the time frame, we, we typically capture on our own time frame. That's our whole flight schedule that we have, but we can make accommodations, but not down to a day. We can capture seasonality, you know, month time frame, uh, sometimes within a week or two if we really, really need that. But it, it depends on if we have aircraft in the area because it's quite the operation that we have. Um, but for thresholds for an unplanned flight, um, you know, again, it's just that area and it has to be um, within sun angle uh, and, you know, seasonality. We also have uh, thresholds on cloud cover and other artifacts like that. Uh, and if 
if it is something that uh, we fly and then we have a lot of other customers that are using it and interested in it, oftentimes it will become part of our standard capture program. Uh, otherwise we can, you know, uh, continue to capture those year over year if, if they're only of interest for that, that one particular customer. So we do do custom flights quite often. All right, well, thank you guys. I think uh, we're right on time with your presentation. We really, really appreciate you guys sharing with us a lot of some really great imagery options from Nearmap. Mm -hmm. So next up in our presentation, Today, we have the Heifeld Secretariats presenting for us. We have Matt Barasa and Judy Sokol from the DHS Geospatial Management Office. Hi, right, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Again, I'm, I'm Matt Barasa with my uh, cohort in crime for uh, Highfield, Julie Sokol. Um, we're uh, two of, of only six feds that run the Geospatial Management Office for DHS. Uh, we actually have uh, roughly 20 contractors that help us out. Uh, but we did have a little bit of a, um, a lull in that support uh, over the winter, but we made sure we, we kept our high field uh, running, although we had to shed some of our outreach and engagement. Um, and, you know, in, in these times, one of, the, one of the really big challenges for us is to, to get the feedback and to stay connected with the folks that are using high field on a regular basis and make sure that we keep the conversation going uh, you know, events like this, we're used to be in person and we'd be milling about and, and hearing from everybody. Um, and, and that's, uh, unfortunately, we had to kind of drop some of that support over the winter, but we're trying to school that back up. Uh, and I'm going to spend some time today uh, uh, explaining and, and encouraging some more communications there, because uh, as everybody has kind of adapted and, and morphed and made their changes and adjustments uh, to life uh, in the virtual world, uh, that's one of the areas that we've kind of uh, identified that we need to do a little little help with, uh, kind of like public speaking. You know, for those of you that took public speaking, the dreaded course in college, and uh, they talked about making eye contact with the audience and and uh, and reading the audience as you went through your th your your speech. Uh, it's a little tougher to do in the virtual environment. Maybe we should have taken uh, t TV news reporter classes instead. Um, anyway, uh, real quickly, just want to give you a quick overview of what's been going on in the GMO over the last year or so. Um, obviously, we saw a major surge in, in high field usage uh, as the pandemic spooled up. In fact, in some areas, we saw increases of four to five hundred percent usage increases. Obviously, those were in uh, you know, the, the obvious areas of things like hospitals, uh, health healthcare facilities, nursing homes. Some other interesting areas that really uh, spiked were uh, some of the transportation information, particularly like railroads and and uh, and also the schools. Um, so we also found ourselves supporting uh, DOD, ironically, as they started being deployed, especially their National Guard, uh, into urban areas, and they needed information for infrastructure. Uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, use case for Highfield, uh, since they're not usually the consumers of that, but because of the urban environment and they had some separate systems, we had to help them out there. Uh, another area of interest, uh, not specific to Highfield, but in general, uh, the, the Geospatial Management Office is the lead for DHS for implementation of the Geospatial Data Act, which probably hasn't hit anybody's uh, major news reads here, uh, but it is a kind of important act uh, because it's the intent of the law is to provide you with better visibility on the federal data, the geospatial data that's available. Um, we're not there yet, um, but it's, it's, we're, you know, for if you're looking for a, a place to go and engage and find out what's being done on the Geospatial Data Act for the state and local uh, and federal side of things, uh, we're a good source for that because we're the ones that are putting together the policy and the strategy uh, and trying to make sure that we maintain a level of operational and mission context uh, to those things when it comes to, to geospatial data. So let's see, the, the other side of this is, is really talking about uh, communications. Uh, I mentioned that earlier, um, but not just communications uh, at the user level, but like, you know, not a one-to-one -one here, but, um, you know, there, that, that is a, a clear area that we need to keep pushing and find more unique ways to have those side chats, the water cooler talk, the, you show up at a conference and you meet somebody and you start talking about, 
uh, woodworking techniques. And at the end of the day, you find out you've got yourself a new contact for, for a new data layer. Um, so those are harder to, to engineer these days. Uh, so we're gonna make a, a more uh, dedicated pitch to be more engaged and more outreach as we move forward. Um, but I also want to encourage uh, you to make sure that you're voicing and communicating your successes and the things that you are doing with high field data to your leadership and encouraging them, if given the opportunity to engage with their federal counterparts, to also communicate that. Because if, you, if we're not consistently uh, showing that message to our leadership, the people that really own the resources that make those decisions, um, it makes it harder and harder for us to keep these programs alive. Uh, one of those recent ones is the, those of you that are familiar with Digital Globe, um, unfortunately that, that program was kind of turned off. Uh, that was kind of a wake up call for us. So we wanna make sure that we're communicating and sending up the message and all the good work that folks are doing uh, with Highfield as much as possible so we can avoid that. Not saying that Highfield's at any risk right now, just uh, I wanna make sure that we're continually, uh, you know, Mike Donnelly and I, are continually doing that from our end, but it really, really helps uh, when, when we get it from, from the user end. So I'd be uh, much rather engaging here, but uh, all right. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started with uh, the slide deck here. Um, so these are just some updates for, for what you can expect to see coming out of Highfield over the next year or so. Um, and I'll let Julie chime in with any highlights uh, for any of these that she wants to bring up. Right, we perform regular maintenance on the FOUO layers within Highfield. So you'll be seeing quarterly announcements coming out for those specific layers that have been updated. And as many of you might know, we're in partnership with NGA. NGA procures the data and then our office is responsible for disseminating that data through several portals. So from NGA, we expect to receive here updates uh, throughout, and you can see there's several deliveries coming up. Um, we also expect to receive updates with parcel data. And then there's a recompete for business points data and potentially a new award uh, to be announced in May. Um, the news, um, not so good news for this community regarding the HERE data is that the new contract looks to be not accessible to state and locals at this time. Uh, that's a requirement that we're working on with NGA, um, but for the time being, we expect that that will not be available, just be the older da data that will be available. And, and that's if, I could, if I could speak to that real quick, so I mean, that's, um, if I could encourage not just information or, or, or requirements back of what you need, we also need to know what you don't need uh, because, you know, believe it or not, there's a finite resources available for us to put this data together. And there's a lot of times where we're having to make decisions and NGA is having to make decisions on what to fund and what not to fund. So sometimes it's just as important for us to know the things that are valuable to you as it is the things that you could do without. Um, so as you, as you think and bring up the ideas for things that you'd like to see in Highfield, it's also just as interesting to us as like, well, what are you not using? I mean, we can certainly look at statistics, um, but that doesn't tell the whole story. I realize that sometimes there's something that might not get used by a lot of people, but is really important to one or two people. Um, so those are, those are good information as well that you can provide as feedback and requirements for us. We'll go on to the next slide there. Um, and, and then here we go, kind of, this is kind of how we're looking at promoting that and getting that feedback. Again, we, we, we love being able to chit chat and, and, and hang out with folks on uh, at big events and small events, but uh, obviously we're having to kind of change our approach to that. Um, so here's, here's some of the things that, uh, that Julie is putting together for our, some of our group feedback. We'll, we're happy to do small and large feedback sessions. Um, and provide feedback on, on both the user experience and what you all are looking for, both future requirements, present. And um, you know, anything else you wanna to add to that, Julie? Yeah, sure. We actually did meet with the NAPSIG team um, back in the fall, but there's a lot of stakeholder groups that we'd love to talk with more. We have uh, NISJIC, I think Daniel is out there on the Highfield subcommittee. 
Uh, but no group is too small. We're happy to have any kind of call scheduled with any kind of group uh, just to talk through the data inventory, your user experience, new ideas, um, future requirements, and then like Max, Matt said, things you don't need. Um, we do have some redundancy in the Highfield inventory. It's been around for 20 years. Um, there's a lot of innovation that can come to that. And we do have a really great comment from Paul Dougherty in the chat. And he wanted to share that one way that his team is using Highfield open data this year is teaching urban search and rescue teams how to add critical facilities and special needs population locations to their strategic and tactical maps. So that's something we would not be aware of, especially being Highfield open. Uh, that's a, yeah. a wonderful case. We'd love to talk with you yeah, more any, about that. Any opportunity you get to, to push that up your leadership chain mm -hmm. um, and over to the federal side would be fantastic. Um, those are. You know, the thing about, about data is it's, it's an intangible thing to talk about. You know, it's not something I can, I can hand somebody who's not a, a technology person to begin with. Um, and then geospatial data is its own niche beyond that. Um, so a lot of time, our, the leadership that we deal with isn't always uh, in tune with, with what the ins and outs of using data are and, and how our mission partners are, are leveraging that information. So I, in fact, so this is probably, uh, we should make this stupid trivia about GMO. We actually sit under the, the chief uh, information officer for DHS, uh, which is pr probably an unlikely place for a, a mission focused data uh, provider to be sitting, but uh, just kind of case in point, well, it's really important just to keep communicating and pushing up the good news stories and even the bad news stories. I'm okay with those too. We just need the feedback and understand what, where, where the pain points are and where you guys wanna go in the future. I think the last slide is just uh, some contact information and then happy to move on any other questions in the chat. Right, and the, the Highfield inbox is listed in that third bullet. You can send any kind of feedback or question and that will get to all of the team. It's a, a team of one <laughs> right now. <laughs> we're, we're working on that, I promise. Yeah. <laughs> um, but there is another comment from uh, Daniel Stelb of Nizjik in the chat too, and he's chiming in that they've been using Highfield open and secure data quite a bit on their internal mapping applications using group queries for an add data tool in a web ad builder. So I know we're going to schedule more time with you, Daniel, but again, those are yeah. um, requirements and use cases we want to talk more about. Absolutely. Yeah. And Any we'll just others? open it questions, comments. Uh, there's a few more coming in. Benjamin Rantz uh, has used Highfield Open Data in the resilience analysis and planning tool. And it's a very important and great addition to the tool. So yes, we're going to take all of these from today and, and hopefully get more from the community as well. And also uh, we wanted to um, mention that you can also feed your, give your feedback through the NAPSIG channels for compilation. They don't have to come straight to Highfield. We welcome that. But I think NAPSIG is interested in consolidating some of that feedback as well. And so a few more questions. Oh, I'm we go to a question. Um, an anonymous attendee loves Highfield and wants any additional information about how to be involved in future feedback sessions. Our hope would be to have another big in-person feedback session like we normally do. And of course, the pandemic has um, curtailed a lot of that, that activity we will still try to do something in the fall, even if it's a, a hybrid event, uh, but we will yeah. get that information out. We're going to revamp our web presence and update some of our upcoming events there too. So um, please reach out to the Highfield support team email address and we'll make sure you're connected and getting all the updates. And a question from Daniel Stelb, is there an interest in joining efforts? with Napstick, Nisjik, and Highfield to have a joint event. I think that's a great idea, quite personally. Yeah, I do. Yeah, we'll take that idea back. And then another question from Dan Miller. Um, he's always wanted to know the best way to provide updates to the Highfield data. A few data sets he works with are sometimes years out of date. That's critical feedback. Um, our NGA counterparts uh, they own the QA part of the process, but any input you have or updates 
you can give to that email address, highfield.hq.dhs.gov, and we will get it to NGA for action. Yeah, that's a, a pretty good, that's a really good relationship that we share with uh, with NGA and Julie's and, and, and I are in pretty constant contact with them. Um, so if there are, and this is again, this is where your feedback goes is into kind of that blending of, of NGA's procurement abilities and then our delivery. Um, so any feedback there, we definitely take back with them and, and work into better procurements. Right, just some more comments in the chat too that we appreciate that you, someone out there has received um, prompt responses from the inbox, so that's good. Good to hear, good to hear. <laughs> if the opposite is true, you can let us know as well. Nice job, Julie. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and Jen McKee um, has updated locations of their state EOC when it moved as well as other items in Virginia. So glad we could make those updates happen. But yeah, anything else? And if there's more that come to mind later, you can definitely go straight to that email address and we'll be at the other end of that. All right, I think we're over our time, is that right? <laughs> That work. Thank you both very, very much. You know, we here at NAPSIG, along with most of the community, um, really rely on and appreciate all of the high field data that is available to us. So thank you very much. And our next presenter that we have up will be uh, Prateek Desai, Senior Product Marketing Manager with Hear Technologies. So Prateek, feel free to take away the screen share. Alrighty, thank you so much for the introduction, Trisha, and a very happy and hearty Tuesday to everyone in attendance. I'm super excited to be talking to you guys today. And before I get into anything else, I wanted to first thank uh, Amanda and Chalk from the Near Map team, and also Matt and Julie from Highfield. I, I really enjoyed your presentations. I was taking notes throughout, and uh, there were some common themes I wanted to echo in what I'm about to share as well. Uh, and I will go through them in just a second. And Trisha, I believe you guys can see my screen, correct? Yes, perfect. Thank All right, you. beautiful. Yeah, so uh, Amanda made a really interesting point about how uh, from the near map team that, you know, they have this amazing data and it's one of the cool selling points of it is that it connects to other marketplaces. I really like that. I like the, the theme of collaboration across the public safety technology community. So please keep that up. Kudos there. And I wanted to echo a point that Matt made during his presentation that, you know, his goal is uh, to continue to stay connected to the community and have two way communications. Um, and also, obviously, thank you for the shout out for the here data that we provide you guys with. I wanted to echo that point as well, because it, it really is a symbiotic relationship. So without further ado, let's begin our conversation today. So today we'll be discussing the razor's edge of public safety. What exactly does that mean? It's really referring to five location-based solutions that are meant to revolutionize emergency response. So first, I'm going to offer a bit of a preamble to kind of walk you through why we're here today, why are we talking about the razor's edge of public safety, then I'll get into what exactly that razor's edge is, and then just in case anyone forgot, we'll go through some takeaways. Guys, please treat this presentation like the price is right. Obviously, you can't shout out numbers at me, but use that Q&A button, feed us with questions. I personally commit to you, you will get an answer back uh, within 24 hours. So public safety organizations are among the most visible public service organizations, arguably out of all different types of government agencies. There's six different types that we think about at Here Technologies. And given the criticality of the work that's done in public safety, we think that this is the most salient touch point that the citizenry has to the government, to public service. So what exactly does that mean? Other than, you know, thank you for your work, you, do, you provide a critical service. It means that you have a high level of visibility. And with that visibility, you sit at the edge of a critical ecosystem of private and public sector organizations. And as you can tell, um, a lot of different types of organizations here, obviously, NearMap, Highfeld, Esri, so and so forth, are, are part of this. And, and we like that and we enjoy it and we appreciate it. And so what exactly does that mean for you then? It means that your tools must leverage your intimate knowledge of the discipline. It can't just be something that a product manager developed in a lab and says, hey, I think this will help you. We really wanna jointly and co-create solutions together. You have the localized knowledge. 
oftentimes years and decades of training, you're already collaborating across agencies like our friends that I felt just mentioned. Um, you're always looking to improve your processes, best practices. Obviously, that was echoing Matt's point about two-way communication. And then last but not least, scenario planning, which I'll get into a little bit in a moment. So all this is great. How do we all come together and advance the public safety discipline using location technology? And the answer is by building and enabling tools for decision support. The outgoing uh, secretary of the Department of Homeland Security echoed this point as well, is that you know, the job of government leaders, especially in public safety, is to enable decision support, making good decisions. There will be aspects that will be autonomous in the future, and, and we welcome and enable that, and we want that everything from AI and machine learning, but we really want to focus on these autogenous decision support tools that are built within the community for the community. And so how? Well, we've developed a new way to achieve precisely that. Now, what you're about to see is an array of five different solutions that I'm going to talk through, and I'll kind of walk you through where exactly we are in the presentation. Each of them covers a different bundle of activity groups that represent some critical life-saving activity that you or your peers are performing at the agency level. Dynamic route optimization, geo-digital twin, real-time operational support, vulnerable population analysis, and last but not least, Vision Zero tools. Let's start off with the first one. What exactly is dynamic route optimization? It is a suite of data and services that plug into existing CAD uh, products to solve for complex routing needs during emergency response. That's great. We're familiar with CAD. We know that emergency response times matter. We want to help reduce them. We also want to improve departure and arrival site selection. What about things like dynamic replanning of routes? And more importantly, at a certain level, guys, these are just corporate buzzwords. What do they mean to you in the real world? Let's take a look. A few seconds can make all the difference for someone in need. Here, routing solutions combine the highest quality mapping data and real-time vehicle updates augmented by AI and machine learning, delivering comprehensive real-time updates on potential disruptions such as traffic, inclement weather, construction, and more. With enhanced situational awareness, emergency operations centers can prepare for unexpected obstacles, ensuring response teams arrive in the shortest amount of time. All right, uh, Trisha, just give me a quick thumbs up. Did you guys hear that audio okay? Yes, perfect. Beautiful. Guys, so you just saw a marketing video here on dynamic route optimization. Let's walk through exactly what that means to you in the real world. First and foremost, we can overlay the geographic boundaries that are of most relevance to you in order for sector-based deployment of emergency resources. So I'm from the city of Chicago, for example. The city of Chicago is divided into six different emergency zones. This actually helps to inform the information that goes into where you want your vehicle stationed in order to do exactly what we mentioned earlier, which is reducing response times and improving our anticipation. Another thing that is enabled through this suite of solutions is AI and machine learning enabled push notifications directly to your first responders. Uh, this is an example where we have a vehicle as a part of a major fleet. The city of uh, Chicago's uh, police department, for example, has over 13,000 vehicles in its fleet. It's pretty huge for a city of uh, just under 3 million people. So imagine this vehicle is driving along the way and they're focused on getting there as fast as possible and obviously saving lives. But what often happens is there may be obstructions along the pathway that they may have visibility into, or they may not. And in this instance, there is a dash cam set up front facing, ingesting data, sending it into the cloud and conducting object det detection. This is then being fed back to the user as a push notification saying, hey, listen, I'm noticing something up to 500 feet, 1,000 feet, up to two miles ahead of you. That, hey, there's a there's an object, there's a pothole, there's there's inclement weather, or possibly there's somebody walking there that you know slow down for or break. This is what we mean by bringing map content, location data, all this stuff to life. What does it mean? It means that when your driver's driving, we're helping with decision support. We're anticipating what they might need to know about before it happens. And then the third thing I'd like to point you to is think about routing. So here, maps uh, as a part of our suite 
is quite known in the mapping community. Our routing capabilities are quite known as well. But the next generation of that actually involves that same object detection, combining it with real-time traffic data, and then rerouting in real time. Think about your favorite mapping app today. It's not able to do that. It's not able to say, hey, you know, the subway station had to use uh, closed down, don't go there. But with this sort of data, with this camera setup, you can do exactly that. And you see this vehicle is slowing down and rerouting as such. I'm also gonna provide you a teaser right here. As soon as the first responder res res um, sorry, responds and arrives on site, we gave them an in indication of where exactly to go for the incident. That will matter in a little bit. So let's take a look at the next solution. This is two of five, Geo Digital Twin. What exactly is that? It is a suite of data and services that also plug into existing geo visualization tools to enhance command center decision-making in emergency response. This includes everything from LIDAR-based products to 3D-based mapping products and everything in between. The idea is that we want to help to disseminate this knowledge of, guys, we need to conduct more scenario planning to improve our anticipation. We want to optimize our protocols for daily emergency events, and we want to improve visualization and change detection. So, okay, you've got this 3D world. What exactly does that mean? Here, geo-visualization tools give government agencies real-time access to a digital twin of their environment. Plan for your missions before they happen by establishing routes, positions, and critical resources, significantly reducing response times and operational bottlenecks. Every street, building, and obstruction can be seen inside and out, from any perspective, from anywhere. With fewer distractions, first responders can do what they do best, save lives. So this is bringing LIDAR and 3D-based mapping products to life. I want you to point out and recognize three things. First and foremost, the ability to juxtapose the real world with a virtual world so that you can conduct these training exercises without actually having to go on site. That is a critical uh, support system that is offered in this solution. The next thing I'd like to point out is very similar to what our friends at NearMap were showing, which I thought was just super cool. It's the ability to conduct precise measurements using a point cloud. That is something that is also offered in this situation. This will be very critical if you need to know what are some major urban centers that you might have incidents in. Where exactly do you need to park? How big of a ladder do I need? Where do I need to post up? Can I establish a line of sight across the street? How far am I from the curb, curb height, road width? Where's the closest fire hydrant? All these measurements are super critical and can be done using these dig digital twin products. And then last but not least, uh, you can actually start to code incident types with equipment requirements. So going back to that fire truck, think about if you know you're going to be responding to a fire at the United Center where the Chicago Bulls play, and you know exactly where you're going to be parking every time there's an incident there, you already know what, what equipment you need to bring to you. And every time a 911 call comes in, if you've coded this incident type to a certain set of requirements of what you need in terms of equipment, we're also further helping to improve our anticipation there. So as we come together, I'd like to move into the third solution of five, which is the real-time operational response support. It's a mouthful. So this is also a suite of data and services. You're seeing a consistent theme right here. This is not just one product. The idea here is to support real-time response by viewing incidents, again, in real-time alongside critical infrastructure. We want you to have the ability to ingest, corroborate, and visualize data enable the safe and efficient dispatch of personnel and equipment, and share information, again, between agencies and the public. Let's take a look at what that means. Smooth tactical decisions require experience and data. That's why having the right information at your fingertips is mission critical. Here, advanced mapping facilitates higher contextual awareness detailed environmental elements such as building access points, traffic choke points, and sensitive infrastructure give first responders the ability to prepare for the challenges that might stand in their way. With the right location intelligence, response teams can make more informed decisions before they arrive. If you're starting to see some consistent themes, that's because these stories all build on one another. First and foremost, 
we talked about coding incident types, right? So imagine a call came in, the 911 center has coded the incident type. They're now deploying vehicles out to get to where you need to go. This driver in the fleet vehicle has already received a push notification of exactly what type of incident it is. It's a cardiac arrest in this case, and giving them the specific decision support of what you might need in order to respond to this, an IV or get ready to have your equipment ready for a possible transfusion once you get them to a hospital. So we're starting to think ahead of the time here. The next thing I'd like you to pay attention to is the fact that we're combining, again, real-time traffic data with not only the address, which is getting you to A, from A to B, but also just pause right here. Look at how much rich data can be visualized and surfaced to a responder's device by bringing all this together and connecting it to a suite. We already know that this hospital has a front entrance that's been blocked. So we're already anticipating this at a time. There's a lot of vehicles there. We're routing them to an auxiliary route, taking them to the back of the hospital where the ER bay is actually located. We're also able to connect with open APIs and ingest ICU capacity data. So this one's at 90%, so we're good to go here. It's almost full, but the vehicle can still be sent here. But within a matter of minutes, that can fill up. How do you send an ask hospital, or sorry, how do you send a vehicle away from a hospital that already has full ICU beds? That's the problem, right? So this is another uh, ambulance that's being re redirected to another hospital because of that data that just changed in real time. And then last but not least, with all the telematics that is being sent back to the 911 center, this vehicle is now approaching the ER docking bay. They're able to then ingest information and share it to the next vehicle about you have an emer incoming emergency to so that first vehicle that just dropped off. Smooth. The fourth of uh, five solutions is the vulnerable population analysis bundle. So this solution is a suite of data and services that plugs into existing visualization tools where public health officials can conduct scenario planning for emergency response and identify day-to-day -day needs to reduce health concerns for vulnerable populations. We all know who vulnerable populations are, right? Like all citizens are equal, we need to help everybody, but certain people need more help. People who live in hospice, people who live in senior facilities, uh, economically depressed areas, so and so forth. Let's conduct that analysis so that we can help to identify those at-risk areas and enable some change of detection in our response. So I'll give you an example of why vulnerable population response matters and bring it to the forefront. I think we've already seen it with COVID-19 a little bit. Certain areas are much more hard hit than others. But let's juxtapose that to another situation, uh, one that you might be familiar with just watching TV. So we have a flood incident that we're going to analyze here. Before a disaster strikes, public safety agencies have the upper hand. Combine local intelligence with industry-leading geospatial data to enable real-time comprehensive analyses of terrain, infrastructure, and local populations. Enrich your existing data, extract new insights, and deploy custom mapping solutions to enhance critical functions. The faster a disaster is controlled, the more lives can be saved and the sooner you can begin recovery. This story is particularly of uh, high importance to me because being in Chicago, this is one of the things that happens. We're basically at sea level, so flooding is very much a reality for us. So how to respond to a flood is super critical. I want you to pay attention to three things that I will point out to you. The first is that there's this really awesome helicopter that is joining this fleet of vehicles that can actually drive through. These are vehicles that are designed to drive through high levels of water, but it's actually not just seeing what's going on and unfolding, it's actually collecting data. As it's collecting data through telematics, it is sending it back to the command center. And here's, I'm gonna pause right here. Here are some really cool data attributes that we're able to help enable the collection of. Where are potential flood hazards? You know, if you have uh, drains that are clogging up really quickly, or if you're in Chicago living along Lake Michigan, anywhere along the shoreline or along Lakeshore Drive is at risk first. Aging infrastructure, if you have buildings that are 100 plus years old, again, in any major concrete city in America, that's going to be an issue. And then last but not least, identifying exactly where those vulnerable populations are, such as folks in hospice, senior facilities, so on and so forth. The next data point I'd like you to pay attention to is that the command center is pushing notifications to the fleet drivers. So the, the aerial vehicles collecting it, sending it back, 
command center is now responding saying, hey, listen, vulnerable populations are here. These people live along Lake Michigan. This is crumbling infrastructure. At first, this vehicle was just going to go pick people up and you know, basically shuttle them back and forth. But now we actually want you to go and deploy flood walls. Again, this is real time ingestion of data and providing actionable insights on what you need to go do based on what's being collected. This right here, this is just, I'm a math guy. This is just bringing math to life for me here. So if you take an uh, image of a geographic area within intervals of 15 minutes, and you can do change detection of how much water is showing up at each time. Again, with our LiDAR and 3D mapping solutions, you can actually measure height and width of areas. You can now actually estimate flow of water. You can all not also now estimate based on how much land is being flooded, what is your ETA to evacuate the whole city? And where exactly are you dropping pins for where you've deployed sandbags? This is super critical. And this is the next generation of responding to major hazards and floods. And I would encourage you guys to think about what are some additional ways that you're encountering pain points that maybe I haven't talked about in this presentation. Like, hey, Pratik, does does this suite do this? Does it do that? Could we stitch this together? Does it work with Esri? Does it work with near maps? Let's have that conversation. Let's figure it out. As the last and final solution of the five, you've been a great audience so far, is the Vision Zero solution. Anyone that's worked with, alongside, or at a Department of Transportation at the state or federal level knows that this term basically refers to an initiative to help eliminate unnecessary casualties on the roadway. But in this context, I'm going to expand the definition to be any sort of unnecessary casualty, not just the roadway. And this solution is meant to enable uh, plugging into existing geovisualization tools and analyzing incidents and eliminating all unnecessary, again, casualties. Let's take a look at how this combines together with a concept known as waypoint routing and also indoor mapping. Indoor mapping can reveal the interior geography of a building before stepping inside. Gain visibility into key unknowns, such as precise incident location and exit paths. Combined with waypoint routing, response teams can locate the precise floor and room of an incident to get to the last meter in the most efficient manner. HERE provides comprehensive inside-out geospatial intelligence to be ready for new, emergent obstacles as they arise. So this is particularly cool because routing is now being expanded to not just point A to B, which is your origin to destination of just your address points, but literally door-to-door -door routing. So in this situation, we have a cardiac arrest uh, uh, no. situation. Precise incident. But where exactly is that taking place? Using the positioning product, we can actually pinpoint where exactly in the building it is taking place, coding that to the incident, pushing that data to the first responder so they know exactly, oh, it's on the second floor on the southwest corner of the building. Furthermore, you now have door-to-door -door routing. So in the prior solution, we're showing you exactly where to park. Now we're showing you which entrance to take and exactly how to route with your device in hand to the exact incident, which pedways to take, which stairwells to take, everything, because you have a comprehensive map of the entire building. This is a capability that we have today. Another thing I'd like to point out is in addition to the optimal parking is the second point. The third point is that this is an indoor map that you can take with you on the go. So in case you ever feel like you're lost, we're showing you on your mobile device, again, you took a wrong turn. No, this is the stairwell you need to go to. And this is where you want to go to after triage. So we saw a lot of really great solutions here. What I want you to take away from all this is that don't worry about all the, the names. I mean, at a certain level, as I told you, they're marketing and, and buzzwordy at some level. I want you to understand that decision support and scenario planning are the areas of emphasis. Those are the areas we want to continue to focus on. Obviously, autonomous is part of the future, but right now it's autogenous. And we want to co-create and build these things together. And this is exactly what we're doing today. Another thing I'd want you to take away from this is that here technologies prides itself as being a leader in this ecosystem. And guys, again, these solutions, it's not like you're buying a car. It's more like building an Olympic basketball team. And we view ourselves as the Magic Johnson. You can build a team around us. Fancy way of saying our solutions work hand in hand with our partners like Esri and others. And we work really well with Heifeld as well. So last but not least, I'd like to just you know thank you guys for uh, tuning in for paying attention and we'll uh, get to some questions here.
we're a proud partner of the public safety community. And, you know, we really thank you guys for the work that you guys do. We, we think you're heroes and we think that uh, you do a great service. So thank you so much for all that. All right, well, thanks Pratik. So it looks like we have about one minute left for some questions. So we've got one coming in right now um, from Bob Bush. How are you updating interior building layouts? And can you consider an informational overload as well? Let's see right here. I'm reading that question right now. How are we updating interior building? So we're given the schematic of a building and we go and build uh, a map based off of that. That's foundational. If you want to talk a little bit more on advanced solutions, like can I get some sort of a digital twin of a building that requires an intimate conversation that's basically based on the LIDAR sensor. So putting that up and then conducting a geospatial analysis of the entire building. Uh, it says like, not like you're buying your solutions, also working with fire marshals to be determined occupancy and pre-planned fire data they may already have. Yeah, again, like if the situation I showed you was a university building. So in that instance, pretend that they gave us permission, they gave us the schematics and all this commensurate data that you just mentioned right now. The idea is to make that actionable so that when there's an incident, you're not just pulling out a 20 by 20 map saying, all right, here's how I can navigate it. It's just pushed to your device. We're trying to make all this data actionable. Um, so we do have an offering in this capacity. It's called Here Indoor Maps. It was a part of that suite of solutions I just mentioned earlier. Um, I'm happy to field any other qu uh, questions you might have on that. Uh, just DM me on LinkedIn um, or you know, reach out. I'm more than happy to pratik.desai at here.com. All right. Well, thank you, Pratik. That was a lot of information for us from Here Technologies. So we will move forward to our next presentation today. So last presentation today, we have Ryan Landclose and Jeff Barani with Esri. So thank you to both of you guys for presenting for us and for the entire team here for staying on the line. Uh, Ryan and Jeff, feel free to take away the screen share and start presenting. Excellent. Hey, Trisha. Hey, everybody. Hope you're doing well. And thanks for having us today. It's a a pleasure to be with you and just to echo everybody else's comments like we certainly wish that we were in person but hey we'll take uh, next best thing which is all of us being here virtually together to talk about innovative data solutions so as trisha indicated my name is ryan langclaus i'm here with jeff barani today and together we lead a lot of our public safety emergency management efforts at esri including our disaster response work through crises of all types all sizes around the world and so for today's session we thought we'd spend you know 15 minutes talking about innovative data solutions in three major buckets. Uh, first, looking at where we see some core ArcGIS innovations, actually building on some of the same themes you just heard from our partners at NearMap and from here. So not to be redundant, but to drive home a couple of points. Uh, second is really looking back over the last 13 months. You know, I reflected back when we were together in Galveston at the previous Inspire event in the end of 2019. Hard to imagine here we are now, you know, 13 months later since we went remote, completely virtual, but we've learned a lot around innovative data solutions around COVID-19 that I think we can apply to future crises, no matter what type that might be. And then the third thing we want to end with is just, you know, putting all that into some practical workflows where we think there's opportunity for all of us to come together and apply some basic lessons learned and workflows around both data workflows, but also then how we build solutions on top of that data that we leverage every day. So. Let's start with the first big bucket and we'll just kind of work our way through this. So please, yeah, always ask questions through the, uh, the chat and we'll be sure to answer as many as we can today or certainly follow up afterwards. So starting out, let's talk about a few core ArcGIS innovations around data. The first is really thinking about ready to use content and data, the evolution of what that means for all of us in public safety to be able to tap into you know, an ecosystem of data that comes from authoritative providers like here and from your map uh, from the high field ecosystem as well, leveraging all their points data, but also then bringing in other partners. So we'll think about NOAA and the weather service, looking at USGS and stream gauges and flood sensors, looking at the national water model, doing prediction at a reach level within any part of our US and even now branching globally, looking at river flow and stream networks. I mean, this, this aggregation of content from all these providers from you and and the partners that you work with is tremendous and it just continues to, have, to evolve. In fact, millions of maps and layers being, being built every day, billions of requests being leveraging all this data in real time content to drive public safety, both decisions and the preparedness phase and also during response. 
And there's a couple of things that we want to point out that's specific, like what's new and different out of this living atlas of the world. Well, number one is some enhancements that we've seen in a lot of the real-time feeds of information that you rely upon for situational awareness. That's looking at both now air quality and looking at what that means from the wildfires up in the West that we had last year. What's the air quality in real time, pulling that together. I mentioned stream flow and gauge networks, updating those to make sure that they are both higher fidelity, better symbology, better pop-ups to reduce the amount of work that you have to do to ingest that data, to be able to exploit that data, to drive decision-making. And even on the imagery front, looking at like VIR satellite imagery coming in. So now we're talking about more repeat cycles to look at hotspots and what burn looks like over a specific area of the, of the globe, being able to, to immediately bring that into our situational awareness tools of your choice and exploit that uh, independently. But there's also something else I think that's really intriguing here for us, and that is looking at OpenStreetMap. We've certainly have heard from partners at here and Highfeld, who Ezra relies upon for a lot of the core data within that living atlas. But there's another ecosystem out there that's doing tremendous work, and that's the OpenStreetMap community really working to build this global base map of the world, to map the unknown spots of the planet, if you will. We've been partnering with them for a lot of years to both facilitate that environment, but also then to be able to let ArcGIS users bring that data in. And there's two interesting things that I want to point out here from an innovative standpoint. One is the ingestion of this OSM data directly into the Living Atlas. What that means is on an update cycle of every three weeks, we are actually reading the latest OSM data, processing that into multiple base map formats or in styles, whether that's you know, traditional street maps or you know, relief maps, um, and then presenting all that back out freely available. So we're following the same Creative Commons attribution license that OSM promotes, but we're doing it in an environment that allow people to then build solutions and maps on top of their ArcGIS environment as they need to, leveraging OSM to bring data in. One additional piece to point out here is, you know, partners like at Microsoft and Facebook who are contributing to the daylight base map. So what that means is not just taking OSM data that's crowdsourced, but putting some validity, some checks against that to validate geometries, uh, to look for, uh, you know, mistakes that are done uh, not both intentionally and unintentionally to the base map, and then also enriching that with, you know, building footprints from Microsoft, for example, and making that customly available into a base map called Daylight. Tremendous work being done in the base map. The second part that's really exciting about OSM, though, is the vector layer, the feature layers that we're exposing. So what do I mean by that? That means that minutely, minute by minute, the diffs that are being created, the changes, the new buildings, the new streets, the new segments, the attribution that's being created globally into OSM is streaming into ArcGIS as a feature layer. That means you can now individually pull in layers for buildings or points of interest or streets you can click on them and get the attribution. You can run analysis against that. So tell me how many structures within a specific area, how many road network uh, segments are within a certain area, how long is a distance from point A to point B, all using feature layers within ArcGIS, literally changing, as I mentioned, minute by minute. So think about a crisis response. And for those that know the history of OSM and the crowdsourcing community, thinking back to Haiti, when literally building the base map of Haiti after the earthquake, and how long it took to get that base map into something usable and decision-making products to where we are today, where we have communities working globally, literally mapping the planet, showing that in real time back into a feature layer to allow us to use that from a public safety perspective. It's just tremendous. So I would encourage you, if you've not looked at these layers before, just to go to openstreetmap.maps.arcgis.com. You can explore all these free layers, exploit them, use them as you need to, and contribute back into that as well. So one interesting point from the living atlas content. Now, the second big thing we want to talk about from an innovation standpoint, core GS is really around this geospatial artificial intelligence, or we call it GeoAI. And the challenge that we've heard repeatedly from a lot of organizations is, while it's great that I see deep learning models put to practice and they're being used and they're training against you know, massive data sets, how do we operationalize that? How do we do that at speed and at scale that's important for us, especially in state and local governments? But one of the things we've been really working on is actually launching and pre-training models around deep learning. So what that means is we're actually bringing in all the open source data science ecosystem, the, the stuff you see to the right side, it's bringing that into ArcGIS, making that exposed throughout the platform of ArcGIS Pro and Enterprise for your normal environment, exposing those libraries to things like natural language processing and object extraction for buildings and roads, even classifying imagery. But 
pre-training model so that you don't have to spend the time to train it. So if you're in North America and you're looking after an event and you have post-event imagery for a flood or a tornado or an earthquake, you know, what's the damage? Well, the first step is you know, extracting building footprints, looking for the change and looking at the road network and maybe obstructions against that. So we're releasing these pre-trained models within the Living Atlas for building footprint, delineation and extraction, road networks, human settlements, as well as land cover classification. So rather than me just kind of talk about that, let's see what that really means. One of the new products we have coming out right now called ArcGIS Image for ArcGIS Online is an online platform that allows you to manage imagery at scale, to exploit that and to do things like feature extraction. So I'd like to use a wildfire scenario here for just a minute and look at the way that we could actually start with where you may be picking up a data set that somebody's done for burn severity and now looking at what buildings might be under that area. So by going into my analysis tab, going to object detection using deep learning, selecting the image of choice in this care, we're gonna look at some worldview imagery from Maxar over this area near Santa Rosa, California. I choose deep learning and now directly inside the living atlas, I can query and I can look and find these pre-trained models, everything from tree point classification and land cover for Landsat, you know, blurring detection for license plate or imagery, but the one we're gonna look at for the sake is building footprint extraction. So simply selecting that and then running the process, which takes some time in the cloud, returning the results of seeing what the building footprints actually are in the most recent imagery in relation to that burn severity model that we're doing from raster analytics and be able to highlight building footprints that might have been impacted. Now, this example is one piece of that puzzle, right? Certainly field teams would be out doing you know, post-event imagery, but think about doing this at scale over at Eastern Seaboard when we have a hurricane that's coming through and coming from Florida up the East Coast. How do we do that at scale and understand where to prioritize those field teams deploying and how to get out more quickly? That's what this really exposes. So I just thought I would share a little bit of that GOAI experience. Now, the next thing from a core innovation side is really in the 3D realm. This is about better visualization, but analysis as well as visualization to immerse our decision makers into the data, to allow them to explore different scenarios from a planning perspective, to change planning assumptions based on the data and to, to gamify that, if you will. I won't spend a lot of time because I think both the previous presenters did an excellent job of this showing you know, our friends at NearMap and ArcGIS Pro and showing what it looks like to do mensuration in three dimension and also look at some floodplains and, and algorithms to do deep learning against that. And here certainly talked about this as well. But I would just say that you know, what's in front of us, this future in front of us right now is that this is much more attainable, right? What we're looking at now is a rendered scene with a 3D mesh cloud doing texturization to that and real kind of visualization to start to look at what flood scenarios both are and could be. So in this case, in the riverfront of Frankfurt, we're looking at the bridge. We know exactly how high that structure is above the water we can start to look at then not just that, but if we had 100 year floodplains or 500 years, new development that's coming in from a mitigation perspective, classifying structures and where they would be above or below that, that water line to truly understand are the plans we're putting in place to mitigate those working? Do we need to change strategies? And think about this from a public engagement, like having this ability to be in a meeting with the community and be able to show them, let's take a look at what this looks like for the bridge that you're used to walking across every day and see exactly that that building on the right is actually 3.75 meters below the flood level at a hundred year flood. Those are the types of conversations that can evolve, not just in understanding who and what might be impacted, but truly getting people to take action, to take the plans into the consideration to mitigate this, to move forward and build resilience. Now, moving beyond just the core, I just let's take a look at the big second bucket that we wanna talk about, which is a lot of the innovations we saw coming from COVID around data. One of those key streams that we heard about was the use in, of non-traditional data for us in public safety. This is things like mobility and consumer data that can augment the traditional data sets that we're used to seeing. We saw lots of people come to the table from you know, Unicast and Blue Dot and you know, even looking at Facebook's mobility data. We had partners like Definitive Healthcare showing bed data and status and mobility within that and SafeGraph providing mobility understanding points of interest for people still going to those points of interest, so they're not going to the points of interest. You see that on your phone when you try to determine if you want to go to the grocery store at a certain time. But being able to bring that data in and then exploiting that is, is the key for us in public safety. So what we're looking at here is California. This is looking at Unicast mobility data, red being you know, you know, mobility at a high level, blue being less, 
And then being able to look at both drivers of that, are people staying at home or are they leaving? In this case, we're looking at temperature over time. The experience being that, you know, our assumption should be that as temperatures rose, people started to travel more often to get away from the heat in the desert, to go to the beaches. And you can actually see that in three dimensions, looking at a county, when the temperature rises, the amber color and the voxel layer that's, that's moving back and forth, we see the red in the columns start to show more mobility. People are moving more often. So think about how we could do more of that. How do we expose these data sets that may be untraditional to us in public safety, but can truly help us understand, are we having the right impact on evacuations and alerting? And there's a lot of other data that came out of COVID-19 and beyond and partnerships that I just want to shine a light on for just a minute. You know, data capable looking at threat and hazard detection around specific points of interest. So this is monitoring things like social media and their own news sources and the like to say, hey, based on this data, we can tell you that there's something happening in proximity to your jurisdiction, to a structure, to a facility, or to a network, a supply chain that might be disrupted. And we can use that as a feature, right, into a map to understand, well, if there's a point or response or by what else is impacted, pulling in the high field data or the here data to understand, you know, cascading impacts from an emerging threat, so to speak. You know, grid metrics on the top right is monitoring real-time power event notifications. This is the derecho from 2020 looking around the Chicago area. Green you see obviously is good, but you watch over time as the derecho passes by the red. And this is real-time power outage data being aggregated and served as a feature layer into our GIS, aggregated at the U.S. National Grid cell to tell you exactly how much power is, is in the area or not. And then finally, folks like GeoSpark Analytics who are doing risk analysis and delivering that at scale right, into data services you can consume and use. I mean, those traditional data sets uh, and the, the new data sets that we see in COVID-19 provide tremendous opportunity for us moving forward through all hazards. We would love to know mobility aspects of, of the community. We would love to know if we're evacuating the right people and did they pay attention to those notices. That can help us change our messaging, change the way we approach them with context that really helps drive action. So the next big thing I want to transition to Jeff at this point is taking a look at Additional things we learned out of COVID, the rise of infographics to support decision planning and truly moving forward there. So Jeff, over to you. Great, well, th great, thanks Ryan and good afternoon everyone. Just a couple more things to share with you this afternoon. Um, first, as we mentioned in terms of infographics, so we saw that as a great tool that many people were taking advantage of you know, during COVID. Um, leveraging business analysts um, is a great way to bring in a variety of different data types, including your, your maps and your you know, services here. So in this example, looking at the, the spring flooding outlook and bringing that into your environment and then being able to create infographics from that that information and looking at, you know, various things like, you know, population trends or looking at other um, of the predetermined templates that are available to you, like at-risk population. And again, interrogating the, the business data, the, the demographic data to be able to show you, um, you know, various trends. Additionally, you can create your own specific reports, whether that's um, bringing in your own data or just going and finding the variables that are important to you, personalizing this just to your agency. Once you've found the reports that you want, you can export these to PDF documents or, you know, HTML pages and embed these in, in apps like the attachment viewer here to take your users through an, a guided tour of some of the um, reports you know that are available you know another, another key you know enhancement and innovative you know data solution is around information sharing so obviously you know this past year we saw you know the explosion of hubs and really using the idea of hubs to put your agency's you know kind of message in context with all of the data and apps that you put together and sharing that in, in great ways and we also saw a lot of multi agency collaboration happening and really this is done through arctis online group membership whether through your your built-in logins, bringing your own identity from um, your own org, or combining this with the hub premium org, um, the community org that's provided, and kind of the have-nots on the right and the haves on the left, all kind of working together. And moving forward, we see, you know, in the next couple of weeks, we'll have a, a release of Arctis Online that will introduce partnered collaboration to allow, to make it easier to um, bring in people to the secure network and have collaboration coordinators let in folks from trusted uh, parts of their organization to see 
um, things. A couple of last words in terms of practical workflow innovations. Obviously, we all are familiar with the John Hopkins dashboard, but I think really the magic what was done there was really the, the data orchestration, bringing in data from various types, including, you know, situation reports, you know, early on to, to help us, you know, bring in and, and see what was going on across the globe. And, you know, looking forward from a data orchestration perspective, ArcGIS Notebooks now in the uh, April release of ArcGIS Align will allow you to run in a scheduled task, you know, basis to allow you to automate some of those repetitive, you know, tasks or chores that you have from a data perspective to bring in and look at elements like this in this dashboard of automatically, you know, running, you know, data analytics on a scheduled basis. Or looking at velocity to help us do things like incident detection and understand where there's, you know, activity near some of our facilities, basically, you know, various feeds of information combined with the things that we care about, then kind of give us those, you know, alerts, you know, coming in. Um, also coming soon is, you know, dashboards will come out of beta and really allow your data to dance now and leveraging, you know, arcade in new ways like data conditionality or advanced formatting, um, data conversion on the fly or support for summary statistics like, like 90th percentile. And then, um, so really allowing to bring your, your data, you know, to life. And then finally, the last, you know, innovation we wanted to talk about may be something, you know, very simple. We heard, you know, lessons learned from COVID and challenging and managing, you know, information and, you know, the frustration from the community of not having, you know, people enter in things like spreadsheets. Well, we're excited to announce that coming, you know, just next, next week with Inside Experience Builder, we'll have the ability to edit tables directly with Inside, you know, Web App Builder. So what this means now is you'll have a very uh, a new simple way to provide your users the ability to update status. Maybe this is lifeline status and like ports, like Chris was you know talking about earlier. But it really kind of gives you the ability to bring you know your your data you know to life, kind of um, you know go really quickly from static data to operational you know status of information. So this is just kind of the last kind of technology trend that we wanted to share with you, and in some of the updates of the tools that many you already have access to today to help you do new and innovative things to support your your mission uh, with some of the tools that you have so with that um you know, i think we're i know we're a bit over on time here so i don't know um brian or, or if there's any questions we want to answer or what we're gonna, where we're going to go next yeah trisha is okay if we take one it looked like there was one that came in i can answer really quick which was you know the data that we talked about earlier through the esri living atlas is that trusted and authoritative uh, for example, is NOAA data that being made available through that uh, coming directly from NOAA, the government? The answer is yes, right? So ESRI partners with those organizations like NOAA, the USGS, and others, as well as third parties like HERE to, to make that data both available into the system, to make it authoritatively available in the system, and then to serve that at scale. So reducing the load on servers and the like that may live on to NOAA, but allowing it to become directly into a, to a ESRI ready-to-use format directly from those authoritative providers. So yeah, we're definitely think of us as the, uh, the the traffic conductor in between pulling all that resource together and then making it available out at scale on top of that. So, so with that, Tricia, we'll turn it back to you. I just want to say, yeah, on behalf of Jeff and I, thank you for having us as always. Thanks for the great work in the community. We just have been amazed over the last year what you all have been able to do and continue to do. And are, we're happy to support you in that and certainly reach out anytime with questions or feedback. We're always here to to be a part of those conversations. So thank you for the time and thanks for having us as always. Well, thank you to the both of you for you know, taking the time to share all of your innovative data solutions with us here at Inspire. And also thank you to our participants and our all of our panelists here today. We hope you guys have enjoyed your first day of Inspire 2021 virtual style. And we hope you guys come back and join us tomorrow. We will be kicking off the day with a session on drones, taking stock of a growing national capability right here at 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>